Space Cowboy Books presents Simultaneous Times, a science and speculative fiction podcast. Short stories to stir the imagination by contemporary authors. Kreutzemeister by Jeff Habiger, with music by Red, Blue, Black, Silver, read by Jean-Paul Garnier. Sixteen October, eighteen sixty-eight. My dearest Emily, my ship docked at Trieste and I was pleased to see that Baron von Kreuzenmeister had sent his carriage for me. The coachman speaks little English, but I was able to ascertain that my journey to the Baron's castle will take three days. I was disappointed at the delay, as the village of Ukans is only 91 miles away, less than the distance from Cambridge to your mother's home in Birmingham. The Austrians have apparently not applied themselves to the modernization of this part of their empire. But do not worry, I shall endure. Just being here is enough to lift my spirits, to be handpicked by the Baron to work for him, fresh from my Cambridge studies, is an opportunity I would not pass up, even if it took me three months to reach my destination. The old profs at Trinity College scoffed when I told them I wanted to study Darwin's theory, and they nearly laughed when I added Gregor Mendel's new research. But they were rightly shocked when I received the Baron's invitation exclaiming that I was the very man he was looking for to assist in his research. I know that under the Baron's tutelage, that I will make discoveries that will shock the world. Yours in everlasting devotion, George. Eighteen, October, 1868. Dearest Emily, I am writing from the most charming inn to be found in Slovenia. It rests along the shore of Lake Bachin, and across from me the spire of the church of St. John the Baptist's curved shape catches the moonlight. We arrived earlier this evening after two days of travel. The journey was slow as we climbed the mountains and low clouds and rain had me bundled in my heaviest coat and under the carriage blanket. But despite the weather, I was struck by the stark beauty of the high mountains and swift flowing river. As we approached the village where I now lodge, the clouds broke and I witnessed a scene worthy of a painting of Constable or Turner as the sun set behind the majestic Julian Alps. Upon arrival, the innkeeper presented me with a letter from Baron von Kreuzenmeister. The Baron hoped I had a pleasant journey, apologizing for the slow means of conveyance and expressed his excitement that we should begin our labors together. I must confess that I am nervous now, so close to my destination. What if I did not meet the Baron's expectations? To come all this way only to be rejected would be devastating. But no, I will not think such depressing thoughts. The Baron has placed his faith in me and my skills as a biologist and evolutionist, and I will do nothing to lessen his expectations. Devotedly yours, George. Nineteen October, eighteen sixty eight. My dearest love, my journey across Lake Bahin started under a glorious sky this morning, but halfway across, a storm arrived out of nowhere and pelted our small boat with sleet and snow. The coachman seemed unconcerned, but I will admit that the sudden change did dampen my spirits after my bout of melancholy and doubt at the inn. Thick snow fell as we docked, and I was unable to get a good view of the castle as we climbed the last mile. But my spirits were soon lifted as Baron von Kreuzenmeister greeted me. He was overjoyed at my arrival and had spread out a fine lunch in front of a roaring fire. We spent the meal getting acquainted and talking of my journey. After lunch, the Baron gave me a tour of his laboratory. Oh, Emily, it is everything I could have hoped for. He has filled it with many of the latest scientific instruments, including several of my own design. 
He showed me how each instrument was used and the work that he has already accomplished. It is so hard for me to describe, at least without boring you to death. But the Baron has made advances in biology that are decades ahead of the greatest universities in Europe. He has already managed, admittedly on a small scale, to create amazing hybrid creatures. Not through a technique as crude as vivisection, but by altering the basic building blocks that reside in every living creature. Darwin was correct that little separates man from the apes, on the genetic level, and the Baron has learned to manipulate these building blocks. I have so much to learn and cannot wait to begin. Eternally yours, George. One, December, 1868. Dear Emily, My deepest apologies, my darling, for the absence of my letters. The Baron has taught me so much about biology that I never knew before, that nobody knows. I spent the first month in study of the Baron's research to be able to understand what he is doing. His research is truly amazing and will change the world. It is late now, so many long days and I must rest so I can begin anew early tomorrow. But the fruit of my labors will be worth it. Faithfully yours, George. Three, January, 1869. Emily. Success. The Baron's project is a marvelous success. I know you will not care for the details, although the science is revolutionary. We managed to create an animal that combines the features of two other animals, like the chimera of Greek mythology. This first animal was only a trout that the Baron added a trait from another fish to make it glow, so it can be seen better by fishermen. A brilliant idea, no pun intended, my dear, and proof that the Baron's ideas work. Faithfully yours, George. 16, April, 1869. Dearest Emily, It has been six months since I arrived at the Baron's castle, yet it feels like years from what I have learned. I confront new knowledge every day, and the Baron has been most pleased with my assistance and grasp of his research. He told me this morning that without me, he would not be as far in his research as we are now. Tomorrow, the Baron and I are taking his latest creations across the lake to show the village leaders. Oh, Emily, this is a most amazing creature, and surely the elders will see the benefits in the Baron's genius. We have crossed a mountain sheep with a dairy cow, so that the sheep will be able to traverse these steep mountains while producing cow's milk. It is perfect for this region, and will be a great boon to the people. And think of the other wonders we can create. The Baron's research will be hailed across the globe. George. 17 April, 1869. Emily. A dreadful tragedy has befallen the Baron. The villagers, the swine, rejected the Baron's marvelous gift. They jeered when he presented it and called it an aberration, an affront to God. They took up clubs and threatened to kill the sheep, and only my swift intervention with the Baron's saber prevented them from attacking him. We fled the hall and made it to the boat where the Baron sat, dejected and shocked as we crossed the lake. A chill rain did nothing to lift our spirits, and on our return to the castle, the Baron locked himself in his laboratory. I fear what this betrayal will do to him. 18 April, 1869. Dear Emily, The Baron emerged this morning rejuvenated. He gave a letter to his butler and then ushered me in and explained that we had a new line of research to pursue. He is making purchases of new animals that will allow us to take his work in a new, wonderful direction. I'm so relieved that our work together will continue. Faithfully, George. 21, June, 1869. 
Dearest Emily, The first of the barren specimens arrived today, and you have never seen such a monstrous creature. It is a massive lizard from an island near the Dutch East Indies. It is as if the dragons of legend had been brought to life. The baron's excitement at seeing the creature has rubbed off on me, and I cannot wait to study this dragon from Komodo Island. I will be taking blood and tissue samples from this creature, but rest assured that I will be careful. I must be brave in the face of the advancements the Baron and I are making. George. 28, June, 1869. My dearest Emily. The second specimen arrived today, a mighty crested bird from Australia, a cassowary. It is as tall as me and has a claw on the inside toe that is nearly six inches long. Despite the long journey, it is still quite dangerous as it delivered a mortal wound to one of the Baron's careless servants who got too close to the bird. Have no fear for my safety, dear, as I will take all precautions as I collect the samples for the Baron. Yours in devotion, George. Thirty, October, eighteen sixty nine. Emily, my love, a new world will be realized upon the morrow. For weeks now, the villagers have become more and more belligerent. They delivered an ultimatum to the Baron that he end his research, and the Baron has rightly ignored their preposterous suggestion. Now they threaten to attack the castle, but have no fear, Emily, as I am quite safe. In fact, because of my work with the Baron, I have little to fear from these peasants. Oh, Emily, I wish you could see the marvel of science that we have created. It's as if Owen's dinosaur of the Crystal Palace has come to life. The Baron has named his creature Deinonychus, a combination of the Greek words for terrible and claw. And it is terrible, in the most glorious way possible. We will present our creation to the villagers tomorrow. They will either flee in terror or they will experience the terrible claws of our Deinonychus firsthand. We are on the cusp of a new era of scientific advancement. Our research will transform the world and only those with the intelligence to understand these wonders will succeed. Do not fret about our future, my darling. I am at the forefront of this new world of science. We are about to change the world. All my love, George. That New Spaceship Smell by Jonathan Nevere. With music by Fog Machine. Read by Jean-Paul Garnier. Dear Kara Horu Lutin, ISA personnel records indicate you as the sole living relative to Wesley Horu, retired captain, ISA Galactic Fleet, Talax Division. As the brother to your great grandparent, Captain Horu is three generations removed, and according to census records, without a direct beneficiary. A recent ISA archaeological expedition to Zerteri system discovered the wreckage of a jawbone subclass cruiser, identified by serial number as Pension Play, in asteroid field R84F25. A recovered log entry was downloaded by the on-site survey team from Pension Play's mainframe. All subsequent entries were unrecoverable due to extensive damage. According to SIAS Prime civilian records, Captain Horu was reported lost in space in 4406 when Pension Play failed to report to its intended destination. We hope this missive brings you and the Horu family some comfort and closure, as well as insight into a lost relative. Please direct further questions to our administrative office through your local ISA census branch. With appreciation for Captain Horu's service in the ISA, Violinti Polari, Senior Genealogy Records Officer, 
ISA Fleet Archives. Date, Day 73, Crescent Cycle. Year, 4398. Interstellar Cruiser, Pension Play. Inaugural Entry, Wes Horu. Captain, ISA, Talex Division, Retired. Space is boring, trust me, I know. I've spent as much time sailing the void as anyone inside the Talex Quadrant, unless you count the cryo junkies. Sea junkies pass the time on long runs in stasis, saving up their biojuice for cosmic sightseeing, the pleasures of spaceports, and terrestrial destinations. They get a bad rap for it, but if you ask me, they're smart. If you follow their extended life policy, being a sea junkie is the way to go. Not me. I'll take good old-fashioned ship travel, day in and day out. As I said, space is boring. The ships that cross it add excitement. I came into this world on a colony ship, lucky enough to win the Diasporic Lottery and be the last gen on its 400-year journey to Sias Prime. Do you have any idea how much space there is to explore and trouble to get into on a colony ship? By the time I was 10, my gang of misfits hadn't gotten further than the southeast slice. That's a mere one-tenth of the ship's aft section. The aft section, not the whole ship. A standard colony vessel has 10 slices. My family arrived in the Sias system when I was 14. Planetary life didn't cut it for me. Maybe ship culture's in my blood. Or maybe because I was raised in space, it always felt more like home. Either way, the first day after graduation from standard schooling, I was up at first light and off to the Interstellar Alliance recruitment station. Five weeks later, I waved goodbye to Sias Prime out the window of an ISA Bobo transport, while the rookies around me shed hidden tears or sat in anxious uncertainty at what off-world life in the cosmic void would be like. What I learned after earning my stripes during my first year of service on an ISA patroller was that something special happens when the last glimmer of your departure system fades beyond sight. It's like the thrill of the first day of standard schooling mixed with lurking anxiety of newfound independence. Just enough to keep you walking away, but not enough to push you towards panic. It works like this. If something goes wrong, and it's beyond the ship's containment measures, or you're lucky enough to be on the wrong side of an emergency shutdown, you're pretty much screwed. That rarely happens anymore, at least since the Great Peace, and that was 200 years before my colony ship left its home system. When a vessel crosses the threshold into free space, there's an innate response to the containment in your future isolation. The motivation to set up habitat and connect with others shoots off the charts. There's nothing out the windows until you reach the next system. Nothing. We're talking years of nothing. One run I was on was over a decade of nothing. On an ocean planet, you get the weather as you ride the sea. Not in space. Want to go out on the deck and breathe the air? Feel the current temperature? Got a death wish? If the cosmic engineers figure out how to break the time-space continuum and push past light speed, well, that would reconfigure the playing field. I'd switch positions real fast. That isn't gonna happen in my lifetime. Not with what's left of it. Maybe some sea junkie in stasis will see that day arrive. But at 58, I'm destined to live out my remaining hours in a straight, ticking analog line. I've worked everything from maintenance, electrical, engineering, to varying degrees of command. As an ISA spacer, I've seen it all. Now, I've washed my hands of it, at least officially. I just retired with enough credits put away to do what I've always wanted, buy my own spaceship. For the first time in my life, I am both an owner and a captain. My new bird is a beauty. I've got a crew of four along for the ride, all fellow ISA retirees. We've done our time, but we aren't finished doing time in space. Terrestrial life just isn't for us. We're fueled up and the ship is stocked and ready to roll. I 
I've said all my goodbyes and had too many drinks with those still in the service who wanted to send me off the ISA way. Where are we heading? No idea. Not sure I care. We'll work it out once we exit the orbital and make our way over that beautiful threshold where Sias Prime falls away, becoming one more flickering blip among billions beyond the reach of my remaining years. This morning was a kicker. Sipping coffee, I checked my data link, and there they were, the approved title and property codes to the ship. My ship. You'd think that after working in the fleet for so long that I wouldn't be affected by it. I've crewed maiden voyages of gleaming, untested ISA ships out of the docks more times than I can count on both hands. Today was different. I walked the 10 minute loop to the departure sector like a kid on their way to retrieve a toy they'd ordered without their parents' permission. The thrill of what waited in the docking bay got more than a few odd looks from commuters doing their daily work grind. Admittedly, I did giggle at least twice on the pedestrian causeway for no apparent reason. When I made my way up the ship's ramp with its shiny railings and bright, newly threaded fabric walkway, a hit of excitement entered my nostrils that would put the rush sea junkies live for waking up from stasis to shame. The scent lingers still as I sit in the captain's chair recording this entry. Years of hard work paying off. The sweet aroma of a fresh start in my nose as I throttle up to rocket off into the next chapter of my life. I'll tell you this, there is nothing like that new spaceship smell. Now it's time to let fate take us where it pleases. I won't miss this place. Too much hustle and bustle and petty distractions from the mysteries that await me out that bridge window. Not sure I really know how to do these log entries properly. Sure, I did them for years as a ship captain in the service, but those were all reports and status updates. I'm retired and a private citizen who owns a ship. What am I logging? This one came out more like a diary entry. Heck, it doesn't matter. It's my ship. I can damn well do what I please. If this is going to be how I talk out my problems and remember the good times, then so be it. I never did like the required therapy they pushed on us in the service after long hauls across systems. But this, I kind of like it, if I'm honest. It's like speaking into a void. Knowing no one will ever hear these words makes it a heck of a lot easier to talk than being on a couch with a stranger looming behind you with a data recorder. Never was very good at that kind of thing. I've got lots of failed relationships notched on my belt to prove it. Most of them, all of them if I'm honest, were my fault. I never learned how to talk about what really matters and what needs to be said. I preferred to play the silence game. In the end, I lost. So many missed opportunities over the years. Maybe I will say them now. Let them all out into this log for no one's ears but my own. Why not? I'll do one a day. <laughs> It'll be good to let it all out. Look at me. A new chapter in my life, waiting in the clear and open expanse ahead. This is going to be a wild ride to rival the best sea junkies travels across space and time. Throttle up and let's hit the stars. Goodbye to the noise of planet and station life. Hello to the silence of space. I'll fill it with honest words in this log. Wesley Horu, Captain of Pension Play. ISA Galactic Fleet, retired. Signing off. In this episode of Simultaneous Times, you heard Kreuzenmeister by Jeff Habiger, with music by Red, Blue, Black, Silver, and That New Spaceship Smell 
by Jonathan Nevere, with music by Fog Machine. Theme music by Dane Luscombe. Come visit us at our bookstore in Joshua Tree or online at spacecowboybooks.com. Don't forget to subscribe and visit us on Instagram and Twitter. We'd love to know what you think of the show.